questions must have filled her heart. She received the angel's words, Lord, I Good morning and welcome to Finley United Online. I'm so thankful that you are joining us for this service today. Merry Christmas. I trust that you and your family are having a wonderful day of merry celebrations together. Merry. Now that word sounds familiar. If you'll remember all month long, we here at Finley United have been walking together through a focused theme for this Christmas season. Our key verse is James chapter 5, verse 13, and it reads this way. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. It's that second question that James poses to the readers, is any merry, that has been our focus this month. For after all, merry is the defining mood of the Christmas season. So James gives further instructions for those that are merry. If anyone is merry, then let him sing songs. This Christmas season, in light of the merry mood, we have been exploring the power of song in our celebrations in what we are calling the carols of Christmas. And here we are today, Christmas morning. We've reached the culmination of our carols of Christmas with this final carol of the season's soundtrack. One more classical carol that tells a truth which extends beyond simple lyrics. It reaches into the celestial, into the supernatural, into the spiritual realms, and it brings us back to Christ, who is the meaning of Christmas. We've moved from O Little Town of Bethlehem to I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. 
We've sung about joy to the world and we've sung about O Holy Night. We've come from O Come, O Come, Emmanuel and then a silent night into today. Our carol today finds its origins in the plantation fields of the South from African-American slaves that longed for freedom, suffering incredible cruelty and humiliation, yet they were still able to encounter the power, the powerful touch of the Holy Spirit. It manifested itself in songs that had unparalleled majesty and beauty. They called them spirituals. That while these spirituals were not written on paper, they were passed by oral tradition from field to field, from plantation to plantation. They weren't written on paper, but they were written in the hearts of the singers. It was shortly after the conclusion of the Civil War that John Wesley worked who was an African-American choir director right here in the great state of Tennessee in the city of Nashville. He felt the need to capture as many spirituals in writing as he could to help convey the understanding and the importance of these songs that were sang by the African-American ancestors during the days of their slavery. Works choir that he directed there in Nashville was composed of churchgoers, community participants, as well as singers from the Jubilee Singers Group from Fisk University, which was a nearby black college. These Fisk Jubilee Singers were a very popular and famous group, and they traveled all over the world during that time, post-Civil War. They appeared before Queen Victoria in England. They sang at the White House for then-President Chester A. Arthur. Their music was heavily influenced by the work of the choir director, John Wesley Work, who had shared these spirituals with them. And in turn, they sang many of these songs throughout the world, revealing a passion for life and living that very few were experiencing during that time. They became a monumental force for exposing the musical talents of African Americans all over the world. It was John Wesley's works, love of music that he passed to his sons, John Wesley Work II and Frederick Work. It was Frederick that uncovered a particular spiritual song that was recorded on paper by his father. And through some updated language and some continued interviews and notes, he captured, or this song captured the uniqueness of a particular piece. It stood alone among other spirituals that were being sung of the day because this was one of the very few that was sung and written about Christmas. Frederick studied the words and he rearranged the original music to, to sound a little more contemporary at the time. And in 1880, the Fisk Jubilee Singers debuted and started to sing around the world what we know as these words. When I was a seeker, I sought both night and day. I asked the Lord to help me, and He showed me the way. Go, tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go, tell it on the mountain, our Jesus Christ is born. He made me a watchman upon the city wall, and if I am a Christian, I am the least of all. So go, tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. Our Jesus Christ is born. And then it concludes with a repeat of the first verse. When I was a seeker, I sought both night and day. I asked the Lord to help me. And He showed me the way. So go tell it on the mountain. These words that sprang forth from a lowly slave's heart in a field under harsh conditions with no hope of earthly freedom, probably unable to read the Bible. This unknown slave imagined the emotions of his or her counterparts, these lowly shepherds that were on the hillside of Bethlehem that day when they were greeted by angelic visitors proclaiming hope to all, to the lowliest of state and to the mightiest in the palace of power. But this song had not seen its finality. 
until the third generation of works. John Wesley Work the third, who was a graduate of Juilliard. He embraced his family's history and passion for these spiritual songs. And so he picked up and continued the work of his father, his uncle, and his grandfather. He began to uncover new documents that revealed previously unknown historical records about this particular song. And so Work devoted his years of life documenting facts about this powerful set of spiritual music that came from the slave fields from generations before. In the midst of the Great Depression, Work the Third was reading over some of these songs and trying to identify songs that would give hope to now a generation of people who were suffering what perhaps at that time had been the greatest suffering they had incurred, no food, shortages of money, runs on banks, and lack of homes and jobs, starvation in the very streets of America. So Work picked up this particular song that his father and uncle had worked on and that his grandfather had worked on. He pulled out new notes and he compared them to the older notes, the historical notes that had been passed down from generation. And with these combined efforts, he wrote the version that we still sing today. It was published in 1940 and it has grown in great popularity over the last 80 years. The song's melody is infectious. You'll find yourself humming it or singing along or even whistling it, but it's not the melody that moves us. It's the power and the spirit behind the words that gives it the motivation and the movement within our hearts and with our minds. These words of an unknown slave from generations before, sung perhaps alone in a field that began to spread across the world and now brought hope to millions of people all over the world every year, to current generations that now have great hope. It truly has traveled over the hills and everywhere. So today we sing it this way, go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that jesus christ is born while shepherds kept their watching or flocks or silent flocks by night behold throughout the heavens there shone a holy light the shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that held our savior's birth go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that jesus christ is born down in a lowly manger our humble christ was born and brought us all salvation that blessed christmas morn go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that jesus christ is born that jesus christ is born. It was Luke in his gospel that would record the record that was sung about here in this particular song. Luke chapter 2 verse 7 begins this way, and she, referring to Mary, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. But the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, and this sign, or this shall be a sign unto you, you will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and let's see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph 
and the babe lying in a manger. What an encounter. What an amazing event. Sister Kayla, while leading us in music this past Sunday, had a wonderful interlude between two songs where she shared this particular piece of the story and talked about how these shepherds who were the outcast of their society, the poor, the, the weak, the, the lowly of those that were alive that day, perhaps the equivalent of a slave during slavery days, someone in low state with perhaps no hope of a better life state. But in that night, they were brought an angelic message of hope that a Savior would be born on that Christmas morning. What an amazing event. And so when the angels departed, the shepherds also departed. They looked at each other and they were in amazement. I, I can't believe this message came to me. I, I can't believe God saw me where I was. I can't believe God sent down this message of hope to me in my place and in my state. So let's go see what this is all about. And so they went with haste and they found Jesus. You see, that's the promise of Christmas, is that Christ came to you and to me, to everyone, to the drug addict that is strung out with no hope of recovering from an addiction that's gripped his or her life, to, to the prostitute that is lost in a hopeless situation of selling herself over and over again because she feels there's no value or he feels there's no value in his life, to, to the one that's sitting with a drug or with the alcohol bottle or to the one who's going through a divorce or the one who's living in a broken home or the one who's been lost a job and they're living without financial means in the moment or to the person who feels like no one loves them and that they're alone with anxiety and depression that's grabbed a hold of them from that person all the way to the one who is celebrating today in the biggest home with the greatest job and with what seems to be the perfect family i want you to know that the message of christmas is that christ came for you in your state and for me in my state and he came to where we were he sent the message to us and he told us that if we would come and find him that he was our savior so the question is, today, will you go? Will you go to see this Jesus? Will you go to find him? They came with haste. But notice, they didn't stay there. Verse 17 of Luke chapter 2 is the key verse for the turning of our message today. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. When they saw it, they went and they told everyone. They went and told it on the mountain. They went over the hills and told it. They went everywhere. And every person they came into contact with, they said, let me tell you, about this Jesus. Let me tell you about this baby that was born in Bethlehem in a manger. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes. We heard about it from the angels and it was almost too good to believe, but we went and we saw that this promise had come for us and it's for you. Go meet the Christ. Go find the Christ. And that's the right response to Christmas. It's Christmas morning. So what do we do with it? Because after all the presents have been opened and after all the meals have been shared, we take the lights down and we take the trees down and we take the decorations down and we pack it all back up in their boxes and in their bags and we put them back in the storage room or the storage building or the attic or the closet or wherever you store your Christmas decorations, just waiting in anticipation for next year when we'll take them out for that short season of celebration. But my challenge to you today is the right response to Christmas has very little to do about bows and lights and trees trees and packages and ribbons and even family and friends and food. What it has to do is while the gifts we received are great, it's about the gift that we were given 2,000 years ago that remains a gift to anyone who would receive that gift today. It's the gift of Christ. It's Christ in a manger then, but it's Christ in your heart today. You see, the right response to Christmas is that when we see it, 
when we receive it, then we go. We go and tell someone about it. So tomorrow, or the next day, or perhaps later this week or next week, whenever it is that you go back to work or you go back to school, tell everyone about Christmas. Not just about the gifts you received and about the food you ate and the family that gathered and the trips you took and the fun you experienced, but be sure above all, be sure that you tell them that Jesus Christ was born. Not just for you, but for them. He is their hope. He gave you great hope and he will give them great hope. I wonder if where you are right now, if you would just lift your hands, lift your hearts and lift your voices and let's give praise to God and thank him for the great gift that he gave us. Lord Jesus, I love you. I thank you for what this day really means for all the celebration that we have around it, while it is wonderful, it pales in comparison to the truth that the gift that came down to us, Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, of a virgin, in a manger. Lord God, I thank you for that amazing gift because that gift brought hope. It brought hope to the lowly. It brought hope to those that live in majesty. It brought hope to those that were broken and it brings hope to those that seem to be well. It's hope to all ears, it's hope to all hearts, and it's hope to all lives. I'm so thankful today that I celebrate this gift. And God, I pray for power. I pray for anointing. I pray for passion to go and tell someone else about that amazing gift. Not just to hold it inside or to ponder it in my heart, but to go and share it with those around. And I pray that that same passion would grab a hold of everyone who is listening to this message today. That with every gift we open, we're reminded of the greatest gift. That with every story we retell and, and about our Christmas, that we infuse it with the truth of that Christmas, the first Christmas. And we give you great praise for it. I celebrate you today. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said amen. I'll oh, say it a little louder. Everyone said amen. Okay, that's better. So now as we conclude today, I wonder if you would make a fresh commitment, a commitment to go and tell somebody about this Jesus, because Christmas is only as good as the story you share with those around. You see, that Christmas would have been a quiet night had angels not showed up to share the good news with shepherds who came to see this amazing story of hope. I invite you, share Jesus with someone today. It's Christmas after all. It's His birthday. God bless you and have yourself a Merry Christmas. Go tell it on the mountain.